the title of my talk is what is the function of reasoning and uh, this is going to be about the evolutionary function of reasoning uh, why did reasoning evolve uh, how can we explain why it evolved by citing some purpose in the evolutionary sense that it serves and I'm going to talk about the uh, discussion of this that's become uh, 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 somewhat well known thanks to Hugo Mercier and Don Sperber. I think their, their book The Enigma of Reason came out quite recently and uh, if you haven't read it it's really fun and fantastic. I recommend it. I'm going to critique it today but uh, I, I want to begin and emphasize that it's uh, really interesting and beautifully written. Uh, I pulled up the uh, opening paragraph of the book on my phone to read it to you just to sell you on why this is interesting. Mm -hmm. How many of you have read the book? Oh, about five of you have already read it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's worth, you know, it's not, you didn't like throw it across the room too many times, did you? <laughs> no, just, <laughs> just, yeah, the norm. The page one of the book says, uh, they drink and piss, eat and shit, they sleep and snore, they sweat and shiver, they lust, they mate, their births and deaths are messy affairs. Animals. Humans are animals. <laughs> and then the book says, <laughs> Well, maybe the fact that we have the faculty of reason separates us somewhat. Maybe this alleviates some of the, the shame of being a human. And the thesis of the book is that it doesn't, really. <laughs> it's not so special. So, uh, looking at your handout at the beginning, um, are people all right with the door open? It makes it a little less cold in here, but can you hear me fine? All right. Closing. There's a vote for closing. Who votes to close the door? Close the door. There's only four votes. Who wants it open? More, sorry, majority rules here. I'll try to speak very clearly. Also, if you have a clarificatory question, you can raise your hand and interrupt me, and I will uh, decide whether it was clarificatory. <laughs> um, so looking on your handout, you'll see as I phrase the main question, it's why did human reasoning evolve? Uh, whatever is distinctive about reasoning in humans, why did that evolve? It seems to be distinct. Uh, and it's puzzling for one reason because it seems that there's something about human reasoning that's unique. It did not evolve in any other animals. That's puzzling because it seems to be a, a superpower. Uh, you'd think that something like vision would evolve because it's useful and then spread uh, to other species. Something like odd, like uh, they give this example, Mercier and Sperber do of echolocation. You might wonder why did only bats among uh, animals develop echolocation or maybe bats and a few other creatures as a very um, a primary form of perception and that, that calls for some explanation but there is explanation it has to do with living in the dark and the costs of developing echolocation. But reasoning, for all the advantages you'd think it would confer on you, hasn't evolved. Instead, it's just in humans and we've taken over the planet for now. So that's one enigma. They say reasoning poses a double enigma. The second enigma is the one we'll talk about more today. Human reasoning is quirky. It seems to be riddled with all sorts of biases, shortcomings, to put a nicer term to it, heuristics. Uh, and uh, these seem to be demonstrably, even by our own lights, unreliable. So one question is, why did reasoning evolve in an apparently imperfect form? And that's the question <coughs> that they mean to answer. They offer two proposals for why reasoning evolved in the way that it did. And uh, I'm going to try to present their proposals so it's comprehensible and interesting even for people who uh, read the book and even for people who I'm also, I, I guess I should have been able to deduce this, but who were given advance access to a draft of my paper. So my goal is one, to present their views and two, then to critique them. 
so uh, we'll have to clarify what some of the critical terminology is. You have on your handout three of the most important terms. Uh, when we ask what the function of reasoning is, we're asking in what sense it has a function in the evolutionary sense. Uh, they say uh, a trait has a function in the sense that it has some effect or your use of the trait has some effect that explains why it would evolve or at least why it would persist. It may have been introduced by accident, but its persistence and its spread throughout the population uh, would be an explanation. So it's some beneficial effect. Remember, clarificatory questions are allowed. And we're asking about the function of reasoning. So uh, reasoning they use in a fairly specific way. Uh, it might seem a little odd at first. Uh, I don't think it's a too peculiar a way of using this term though. They say that reasoning is uh, a subspecies of belief formation. So in general belief formation uh, it typically happens somewhat blindly. We form beliefs and we don't know where they came from. Uh, following Anasara's talk, this should seem somewhat reasonable. They come out of nowhere. Maybe it seems unprincipled. But uh, when we form a belief and we, in doing so, represent to ourselves, they say consciously, I think we could say accessibly or access consciously, a reason for the belief we formed that's reasoning. So to repeat, reasoning is belief formation that's accompanied by representation of a reason for the belief. Uh, what is this reason that we represent? It's not the real basis. It's not what really caused you to form the belief. Not necessarily. That would be uh, perhaps uh, the motivating reason or the premise. It's also not necessarily a good reason. It's not what we might call a normative reason or what they call an objective reason. It's a confabulated reason. So it might be good, it might be bad, but we come up with it and we have access to it and we're ready to publicize it. So reasoning is forming a belief and having some advertising ready to go with the belief. That's what reasoning is. And um, it seems to me like it's, it's a, one natural uh, description of a way that we form beliefs. Or one natural definition also to give to reasoning. Hopefully one worth puzzling over and trying to explain. I think if you pause and think about it, it should be puzzling. Why do we uh, form beliefs and also have some kind of ability to reflect on how we form the beliefs or where they came from? Why don't we just form the belief? Other animals might do that. Uh, we seem to have some ability to uh, you know, deliberate. And, and if you wonder why we do, the natural answer might be, well, if I can represent to myself a reason for the things that I think, maybe I can share that reason with other people. And this is going to naturally lead to the proposal, the first and more well-known proposal they have. Uh, reasoning has this social function. It has a function that improves our ability to efficiently communicate with each other which uh, would naturally help explain why reasoning evolved in humans. We're a very social species. They describe us as hypersocial. We rely on language. And the way we rely on language is a little more uh, elaborate and extensive than the way that uh, other animals, to the extent that they do, may rely on language. So if you think of reasoning as belief formation accompanied by the representation of some reason, and if you think that we rely on language extensively, maybe it's helpful for our use of language to represent reasons for the things that we might want to communicate. This is the gist of the argumentative theory of reasoning. They've got 
two theories of what the evolutionary function of reasoning is. This is the first one. This is the one that first became famous in uh, uh, the Brain and Behavioral Sciences paper they wrote in 2011, got written about in the New Yorker and the New York Times as well. Uh, I think the title of that paper was uh, Why Do Humans Reason? Arguments for an Argumentative Theory. Then in the book they added a second theory. We'll get to that at the end. I'll spend most of my time talking about the argumentative theory. So you have it in the middle of your first page of the handout here. The, the, the function that reasoning performs here is a function it has to uh, overcome a certain challenge that we face. Communication comes with a challenge, they say, a certain problem. In other work, especially uh, uh, a paper titled Epistemic Vigilance with many other co-authors, uh, they said that we should give the name epistemic vigilance to this feature of human psychology, which is our uh, tools we use to be cautious about accepting testimony. If we just believed everything we were told, we would uh, face all sorts of uh, harms. We have to uh, somehow be discriminating or critical when we accept testimony. We'll be uh, dupes, we'll be gullible, we'll be fools if we believe everything we're told. So we've got you know, a range of uh, tactics that we use to uh, consider whether testimony is trustworthy. They emphasize tactics like checking whether the testifier's story is coherent or whether the testifier's reputation is good, uh, whether they've uh, been right on other occasions or things like that. Uh, those are their examples, uh, but it's plausible that, of course, there is a thing that we could aptly name epistemic vigilance. So epistemic vigilance has a benefit, but it also brings a cost. If hearers are too vigilant, then some testimony is not going to get transmitted. We're going to miss out on valuable information that it might be beneficial to take up or to share with others. So the challenge of communication is to somehow overcome vigilance when it would be beneficial. And they say that the function of reasoning is to overcome that challenge. So as I put it on the handout, we use reasoning to make testimony persuasive, to overcome vigilance so that we, we can achieve beneficial communication where we otherwise couldn't. There would be no communication uh, if we didn't have reasoning. If we couldn't, as testifiers, also come up with some reasons to give to the hearers in support of what we want them to believe. Okay. So, what can be said in support of this theory? They want to uh, explain why reasoning has all of the oddities, <coughs> the, the quirks that I said it has, the, the biases that are now popularly associated with Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and all the work of Tversky and Kahneman, and they're just sort of, I don't know, the, the poster theorists for a whole industry of cognitive psychology that says there are all sorts of uh, biases or heuristics in reasoning. So Mercier and Sperber want their theory to explain these quirks, and they focus in particular on the confirmation bias, as it's popularly known. They, they think it should have a new name. They want to call it the my side bias. And uh, they say that it should look odd why the bias exists if you just consider it, but upon consideration with the argumentative theory in hand, we can explain why there is a confirmation bias. Why human reasoning has this uh, skew where we're better able at coming up with reasons for the things that we antecedently believe than we are at coming up with reasons for any hypothetical view we might be entertaining. 
So the reason they want to change the name confirmation bias to my side bias is that it's your own views, your own antecedently held views, that we have a bias in favor of, uh, uh, that we have a biased ability to come up with reasons for. So famous examples are things like if you're asked your view on whether or not the death penalty is an effective deterrent or justifiable or things like that or whether affirmative action is a good idea. Uh, the standard psychological story of how people approach these questions is first they have a view, but they, they pull the view out of their ass. The view comes out of, oh, I forgot they're recording this. We'll edit that. Uh, first, first people just come up with a view out of nowhere. This should seem plausible. And then after the fact, people come up with uh, supporting reasons for whatever they came up with. Uh, it even makes sense of like, uh, the way philosophers behave. Uh, you know, if you ask a philosopher the reasons for the view that they, they've been defending for a long time, most of the reasons that they're going to tell you are reasons they came up with after they decided to defend the view. You can also notice people are naturally defensive. They're, uh, you know, you, you see what view they have and then you uh, uh, try to discuss it with them and, and um, they're not going to as easily uh, tell you the uh, problems with what they think as they are going to easily tell you all the support for what they think. So we're kind of like uh, lawyers for our own beliefs. Hopefully that's a plausible description just intuitively even without the need for uh, government-funded cognitive psychology. So, that's weird. Why do we have a my-side bias? Uh, it's so that when we're giving testimony, we can make our testimony persuasive. I hope I'm not making their theory sound so bad <laughs> that the objections won't need that long to be presented. But here's the first objection. We're looking at the bottom of the first page of the handout. So let's say that a uh, communication is occurring between two individuals that we'll call sender and hearer. So if we're going to give an uh, evolutionary explanation of uh, why there's a my side bias, uh, we need to explain how these individuals enjoy some benefit they are explicit, Mercier and Sperber, that their proposal is not that group selection uh, took place and contributed to the evolution of reasoning. It's the more familiar traditional form of individual selection. There's a benefit for each individual. Group selection is also controversial. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves these questions. What are the benefits to each party? In the case of here, the benefit of communication would be getting some new information. Why do we give information to others? What's the benefit to sender? You can sort of imagine in general why it would be beneficial. Why do you let other people know important stuff? Because it's good for us, for other people to be informed. Uh, information, true information is a public good. But now we're specifically asking this question, why is there a my side bias? Can Mercier and Sperber explain why there's a my side bias? And we would have to see how it would be beneficial for sender to have this bias. That's our question. So why is it good for sender to be able to persuade hearer in such a way that the um, communication wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a my side bias? They say that a benefit that sender gets is this fairly uh, uh, mercenary and unsavory uh, aspect of human nature. Sender can manipulate or control hearer. Sender can give testimony to hearer as sender wishes for sender's benefit. It is kind of obvious that there's some in the brutish evolutionary sense benefit to being able to control or manipulate another individual. That's true, if sad. But the question that we need to ask here specifically now, and here's the, the, you know, the heart of my first objection is, does a my side bias bring to sender even that 
uh, sad and mercenary brutish evolutionary benefit. It is beneficial to be able, in an evolutionary sense, to be able to influence others and get them to believe whatever you want them to believe. But is it beneficial to have a bias or some sort of skew that gets you to share your own beliefs with other people? So suppose, you know, we're like out in some uh, environment that plasticine hunter-gatherer humans were out in and, you know, I'm talk imagine I'm talking to Declan and I want him to, uh, I don't know, help me collect the whatever hunter-gatherers were gathering or hunting back then. <laughs> It might be beneficial for me to tell him to like go uh, off and uh, do some hunting or gathering in an area where I know he's not going to compete with me. <laughs> but how's the my side bias going to help me? The my side bias is going to skew me to get him to believe what I believe. And although that is perhaps often a good thing, I don't see why having a bias that leads me to come up with reasons in favor of my view better than I'm able to come up with reasons against my view. I'm not, I'm not understanding at all how that's beneficial. There's the uh, intuitive rough version of the objection. So as I say it on the handout, sure, if I could make you believe whatever I want you to, that could be useful to me. How does it benefit me to make you believe whatever I believe? Why do we have a bias for that? Let's go through the objection a second time more slowly. Let's look at it by partitioning the possibilities concerning who has what evidence in their possession. So Mercy and Sperber don't talk about this topic uh, as far as uh, I recall and as far as my research turned up. Uh, they don't think about how communication is beneficial in different ways depending on whether the communicator has new or special or different evidence than the hearer has. Uh, they also don't talk about why epistemic vigilance could be uh, uh, useful or harmful or go differently depending <laughs> on whether or not there's one asymmetry or another in the evidence between the parties. So let's look at the question for ourselves and see what we come up with. Let's divide it into three cases. Case one Sender has no better evidence than hearer, case two, and three, sender does have better evidence, but either they do or they don't know that they have better evidence. Well, in case one, if sender's trying to communicate something to hearer, and sender doesn't have any better evidence than hearer has, why would the my side bias be beneficial? Why would we want hearer to form their beliefs uh, in a way that uh, reflects the beliefs of somebody who has poor evidence? There's no benefit to that. Again, we're not manipulating here. We're trying to create a clone, the, c the sender is. And if the sender is in a evidentially worse position, there's no benefit there. There's no benefit to sender. But that's what the my side bias seems to be doing. Case two. Sender does have better evidence. And moreover, they know that they have better evidence. Okay, present the evidence. That should be easy. We've stipulated that sender knows they have this evidence and that it's better. So again, here, why would we want to invoke biased reasoning? Why would we want to come up with, or why would we have a, uh, a skew in our ability to uh, point out what, what favors our view to what disfavors our view if we have evidence that the person we're communicating with lacks regarding the issue and which we know they lack? Okay, last hope. Sender has better evidence, but they have no idea. We have to turn the page. So I emailed my paper to Mercier and Sperber, and uh, Mercier very generously did wrote, write back and say where he disagreed. And he thinks it's case three. This is where the my side bias might help. So in the spirit of objectivity and overcoming our own biases, let's try to think whether or not 
I have a good point here. Maybe, maybe this is the weakest part of the paper, but in being so upfront about that, I undermine the phenomenon of the my side bias itself. So even that, they don't win in the end. But let's consider. Is it beneficial to have a my side bias if you uh, have better evidence, but you don't know that you do? Should you fight harder for your own view than be critical? It seems to me it would amount to a blind policy. Uh, if you've got this bias when you don't know whether or not you have better evidence, then you're going to be fighting for your view in case three just as easily as you'll fight for your view in case one where you don't have better evidence. And I think we all agreed that in case one it wasn't beneficial to be the uh, zealous advocate for your own views rather than a even-handed advocate and critic. So I worry in case three that the my side bias will succeed no more often than it backfires. So uh, in the end, I, I think that when we consider the uh, evidential possibilities, I don't see any apparent place for the my side bias to be advantageous for it to uh, allow communication to overcome this obstacle that they say uh, we face, the obstacle of epistemic vigilance. Nobody's asked a clarificatory question yet. Hopefully that's because uh, this is pretty clear. Yeah, okay, good, thanks. All right, uh, next, uh, oh, let me judge my use of time. So that, th when did I start, at 11 or 11.15? 11? Oh, okay. Oh, let's skip whether or not my own view faces... <laughs> no? All right, we'll go really quickly. Uh, so uh, in a series of papers, I developed this view. I gave it a name because I believe that if you name your view, it's easier for people to keep it in mind and remember it and think about it. Uh, that, was, that was the only reason I did that. I recommend it to you. So I named it Epistemic Communism. Even if you dislike the view, that helps, you know, you remember it. So uh, this is also a view about the function of a practice of ours. It is uh, a function in this um, uh, sense that we associate with Millikan and Neander and is the same sense that they're trying to explain the evolutionary function. It doesn't have to be a biological function. It doesn't have to be natural selection. It could be cultural selection or artificial. It's not artificial, but it could be. Uh, cultural is plausible. Uh, but it's again uh, the function, but it's not of um, the way we form beliefs or the biases we have, it's the function of the way we use language uh, to evaluate one another. And I say we use epistemic evaluations like calling each other irrational or saying you don't know what you're talking about in order to encourage uh, a kind of coordination in our belief forming methods, in order to get each other to form our beliefs in the same ways as one another. So it involves using the same rules like not being too cautious about global warming, not being too quick to jump to conclusions about terrorists, or yeah, so they're not terrorists. Um, and uh, also not just sharing rules, but sharing, uh, uh, but avoiding performance errors, uh, like when you're trying to prove something, avoiding a uh, affirming the consequent. So in my view, there is also a kind of selfish bias. There's a bias towards our own belief forming methods being favored and promoted when we use epistemic evaluations. So does that mean that uh, my view is similar enough to theirs to have similar problems? No, because I, I don't aim to or think that I could explain the my side bias. The my side bias is a bias uh, toward certain contents. It's the bias to find reasons in support of what you believe. But my view is just that we have a bias towards the promotion of our own belief forming methods. Uh, and uh, that wouldn't lead you to guess that we have a bias when it comes to coming up with reasons or arguing for one view or another. All right, if that was too compressed to make sense, uh, don't worry about it, but if people want to talk about it more in the Q&A, we can. Let's talk about uh, the argumentative theory again some more. So I think the first objection 
should be sufficient and it is really a um, part of Mercier and Sperber's view that an individual instance of communication should be able to exhibit the benefits of the my side bias. But in the spirit of, again, generosity and overcoming the my side bias, let's think a little more about how their view could be defended. So you see in the middle of page two of the handout I'm considering under the heading my second objection. Could they ev evade the first objection by conceding that biased reasoning doesn't exhibit a benefit if we only consider an isolated instance where we've got sender, hearer, sender speaks to hearer, and that's the whole story. What if we took a larger perspective and imagined uh, how even in an individual conversation we take turns in our roles as sender and hearer. Uh, and we might be engaged in a, a joint search for the truth Maybe some benefits emerge as we each play the role of lawyer, zealous advocate, for one view at a time. Maybe we thereby divide the labor of seeking out the good reasons for and the reasons against uh, a, a view or on whatever issue we're debating. And that's where the benefit emerges, through this division of labor in seeking out the pro and the con reasons for whatever we're looking into. So my objection or here is, or my question is, how does that really explain why the bias evolved? That doesn't explain what's beneficial yet, because though we associate this notion of a division of labor with benefits and efficiency, it, when you think about it for a second, actually isn't clear at all why it would be efficient to divide the labor of seeking out the reasons on either side of a given issue. It, it may be a fact, it does seem to be a contingently true fact about the human mind that we reason better when we just pick one side and fight for it. I guess that's why in philosophy we each have to like sign up for a certain view and come to be known as you know, oh that's the communist guy. He's gonna, he's gonna, if he can't answer your questions about it then there must not be any good answers because the person who's become signed up as the lawyer for that view is the one who you'd think is gonna be able to make the best case for it. Well, yes, it does seem to be true in, in uh, human psychology that uh, when you somehow become the, the advocate, you are better at defending than undermining your own view. Uh, we have the bias. But that's not an explanation of how it's beneficial. Why is it a contingently true fact about the human mind that when we're the zealous advocate for just one side of the issue, we're better at coming up with reasons. Why do we, in philosophy, need to talk to other people to see the problems with our drafts? We do need to talk to other people. Uh, it is efficient to have a conversation when you're trying to work on a problem, not just philosophy, but others. But that's not an explanation of why it would have uh, evolved. What, that's not an explanation of why it's beneficial. They give this example uh, in the book at some length of two engineers who are trying to design a bridge. All they want is for the bridge to be successful and one of them makes the case for a cantilever bridge, one makes the case for a suspension bridge and this goes better than if they each just considered the pros and the cons for either proposal. Uh, there, there does seem to me perhaps some worry here that you could uh, uh, suffer some redundancy if you each consider the, the reasons for the cantilever bridge and the suspension bridge. Uh, it could, things could get a little complicated, maybe even a little clearer, like if we've got some mathematical conjecture and we're trying to figure out whether it's true or false, maybe better if, if, like, if I ask uh, Luis to try to refute it and I ask Anasara to try to prove it so that maybe they'll come up with 
the relevant tools or lemmas for their own case in a way more efficiently than if they were each considering how to prove or refute it. These possibilities came to my mind. They don't really pursue it in the book. Uh, maybe here there's a kind of benefit to dividing the labor. I'd be interested to hear what you think. This seems to me uh, unusual and limited. It doesn't seem to me to be the normal case in everyday human thinking and communication. The my side bias, the confirmation bias, is supposed to be utterly prevalent. Uh, you're supposed to, once you learn about it, see it everywhere you look. Uh, I don't, I'm kind of skeptical about the whole thing, but that's not today's topic. Uh, let's pretend it's real. You probably all think it's real anyway. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't seem to me that like trying to prove or refute a conjecture or design a bridge is very similar to what happens in ordinary communication. This my side bias trips us off on the most elementary thinking. Uh, we're supposed to stink at the, the Waysan selection task where you turn over those cards to see whether every vowel has an even number on the other side because the my side bias is, is infecting even that reasoning. Um, I don't see how the redundancy in the search for lemmas relevant to a refutation rather than a proof applies there at all. So I don't think that um, we have a good explanation of why we divide the labor of seeking out the reasons for and separately against a view. Okay, more briefly now let me turn to their second and newer proposal about the function of reasoning. They didn't give this one a name, so I'm naming it the justificatory function of reasoning. So the view here is that we use reasoning to come up with reasons, by the definition, that we use to publicize our decisions, our beliefs, and our actions as justified according to the generally accepted social norms. So why, why do we uh, uh, act as our own... Uh, um, agents for our publicity and reputation? Why do we advertise that we play according to the accepted rules? Well, Mercy and Spare Bear say this brings some benefits. It makes us look trustworthy. It makes our actions look explainable and predictable. And these are benefits we have. Uh, I'm going to read to you a quote or two from their presentation of the justificatory view, because I think I need to use their words to give a fair presentation of the idea. Here's a few quick quotes. It's not in your handout, so you'll have to listen carefully right now. Ready? By giving reasons in order to explain and justify themselves, people indicate what motivates and in their eyes justifies their ideas and actions. Okay, there's mention there of motivation. In so doing, they let others know what to expect of them and implicitly indicate what they expect of others. Evaluating the reasons of others is uniquely relevant in deciding whom to trust and how to achieve coordination. So they're talking about how this has some benefit for um, explaining our motivations, uh, knowing what to expect <coughs> from, from each other, and also knowing who to trust. There's also mention of achieving coordination. Uh, on your handout, I mentioned those in the summary. Now let me read you a little more where it's emphasized that the reasons that we're selling aren't the real reasons that led to us to have the views or take the actions that we took. When we justify ourselves, we present our motivations as normatively apt and we present norms as having motivational force on us. In doing so, our goal is not to give an objective sociological or psychological account of our actions and interactions. It is to achieve beneficial coordination by protecting and enhancing our reputation and influencing the reputation of others. As far as mind reading goes, the attribution of reasons is typically misleading. The causal role it gives to reasons is largely fictitious. The reasons people attribute to themselves or to others 
are chosen less for their psychological accuracy than for their high or low value as justifications. The ability to produce and evaluate reasons has not evolved in order to improve psychological insight, but as a tool for defending or criticizing thoughts and actions. So I spend less time on this view because it's just utterly incomprehensible to me. My objection is it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so you see on the handout I have the caveat, our advertised reasons are not reliably our actual motivating reasons. If the function here is to let others know what to expect of us or help them reliably decide whether we're trustworthy and we're all, what we're selling them are fictions, well, where's the benefit? Where's the evolutionary benefit? So it sounds to me like they haven't really explained anything. Yeah, it's nice to uh, manage your reputation. And we all do that. We all know that. We all know that we describe why we think something or why we did something in the best possible way we can because we like to look good. But what's the 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 cash value benefit of that. You can't evolutionarily explain why we do something by saying we like to do that. Uh, you can explain why we sleep when, when we successfully sleep. Many of us here haven't lately, but we're still doing okay. Uh, by saying we get tired. You can't explain why we tell each other jokes by saying we like to laugh, they're funny. It's a total evolutionary mystery why we make jokes. Nobody knows why we sleep either. Sometimes there's a headline in the newspaper now and then, scientists uncover why we sleep or the function of sleep. Total baloney. Every time. I've stopped even opening the articles. No one knows. We know why we eat. The answer is not we get hungry, but we figured that out. <laughs> it's something to do with nutrition and uh, energy. Okay. But it's not that we're hungry. That's not the evolutionary explanation. So likewise, we don't know why we sleep, we don't know why we tell jokes, and we don't know why we have these biases that lead us to act like, you know, we need to manage our reputations as though, I don't know, the Hollywood press is going to take away our career. So, uh, let's see. Do I have time to talk about the parting question? We have like 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Okay, let's get to it. So, uh, did you actually mean something else? 14. Oh, 14? Yeah, of course. Oh, oh, I got an email saying the talk should be 45 minutes. Yeah. Is that right? So, uh, <laughs> so, if you think I have 14 minutes, I have negative one minute. Yeah, I thought it was an hour and then half an hour for Q&A, but um, if the email say so. <laughs> All right. It's over now. Thank you very much.